Hi, everybody. The Living New Deal's New York City chapter and the Schwartz Center for Economic Policy Analysis are the hosts for today's program. Social Security, Demographics, Economics, Politics, and Future. Presentations start with the creation of Social Security in 1935, followed by changes over the decades and ending with the current challenges Social Security faces. Panel discussion will follow with Q&A moderated by Professor Teresa Geladucci. Social Security's future is a particularly timely issue. The Republican Study Committee has been pushing Speaker McCarthy to use the upcoming government spending fight to cut benefits, raise the retirement age, and fundamentally change its structure. McCarthy has recently announced his intention to form a commission to make such changes to Social Security. He wants it to be bipartisan by recruiting some Democrats. Democrats need to chart a different course. This makes discussion of Social Security's future strengthening through expanded revenue and increased benefits particularly urgent. 29 years ago today, on June 29, 1934, President Roosevelt issued an executive order establishing a committee on economic security. He charged this committee with studying the problems relating to the economic security of individuals and recommending proposals that would promote greater economic security. Their recommendations were the basis for the Social Security Act. After passing through Congress, President Roosevelt signed it into law on August 14th, 1935, the birthday of Social Security. I now pass the torch on to Professor Geladucci to moderate our uh, panel discussion and its Q&A. Thank you. Oh, hello, I'm Teresa Gelarducci, a professor of economics at the New School for Social Research. Thank you everybody for coming. Um, we will um, have a very spirited panel with the, the top experts in the country talking about social security, the past, the present, and uh, we'll all talk about the future. I'll moderate your questions and answers and I'll, your questions with um, hope that we'll get answers from our panelists. So please um, use your question and answer button freely. Um, I will hand it over now to Kevin Baker to introduce himself. Uh, thanks, Teresa. Uh, I'm a member of the New York City chapter of the Living New Deal as well. I'm also a historian, novelist, and journalist, and I'm currently working on a history of the United States between the world wars to be published by Houghton Mifflin. So the United States was very late in coming to Social Security or any sort of national safety net. Uh, the first social welfare state was instituted uh, by the German Empire in, 19, in 1883 under Bismarck, uh, who actually defended it in very similar terms to FDR. He preferred to call it practical Christianity. Uh, the term itself, social welfare, came from something Benjamin Disraeli wrote in an 1845 novel, which was, power has only one duty, to secure the social welfare of the people. You know, to conservative European statesmen, such as Bismarck and Israeli, the welfare state was accepted as a necessity to fend off revolution. Here in the United States, without nearly as strong a socialist movement, there was much less of an impetus toward any such thing. By the 1920s, many Americans were convinced that the dole had demoralized the working class of England, and even some union leaders were leery that giving away benefits would dampen any incentive to organize. Labor Secretary Francis Perkins would say that nothing else would have bumped the American people into Social Security except something so shocking, so terrifying as the Depression. So it was. By 1934, there were clubs all over the United States promoting the Townsend Plan, a scheme under which everyone over 60 would receive $200 a month as long as they agreed to immediately spend the money, uh, while Huey Long was calling for pensions and free medical services for all under his Share Our Wealth program. Perkins was ahead of them both. When Franklin Roosevelt asked her to be the first woman cabinet secretary in history, she told him she would only take the job if he would back her ideas for a full social welfare state. Perkins wanted the whole Megillah, 
a major public works program, workers' comp, child labor and safety laws, unemployment and disability insurance, health care, and an old age pension plan. Roosevelt, almost to her surprise, agreed. And while the first year of the New Deal was mostly occupied with getting the country back to functioning, by 1934, Perkins thought the time was right to go for it. It is probably our only chance in 25 years to get a bill like this, she told the president. The administration was still highly popular, but with the National Recovery Administration floundering and long posing a serious third party threat for 1936, the New Deal needed to reinvigorate itself. Oh. FDR and Perkins named a cabinet level Economic Security Committee in late June 1934 to come up with concrete proposals. Like all the best government committees, this one was largely cooked in advance, excluding, as Kirsten Downey writes, most experts on the subject who were so committed to one concept that they couldn't be open-minded. This did not preclude controversy. Henry Morgenthau, the Secretary of the Treasury, insisted that the payroll tax be increased so the pensions wouldn't be a handout. Uh, Barbara Armstrong, a brilliant law professor from Berkeley, took to leaking nasty comments to the press about Perkins and referring to the executive director of the committee, Edwin Witt, as half-wit. You'll, you'll remember the old Woody Allen line about how intellectuals are like the mafia. They only kill their own. But the detractors did have some valid criticisms. Professor Armstrong objected to the state federal partnership in unemployment insurance, warning that it would lead more conservative states to find ways to lower their payments. Morgenthau feared that the Social Security Reserve Fund needed to be bigger, both concerns that would become real issues in the years ahead. And through all this, the Economic Security Committee was working against FDR's seemingly arbitrary deadline of finishing a report before Christmas 1934. On the night of December 22nd or 23rd, Perkins assembled the committee at the home she had shared in Georgetown with Mary Harriman Rumsey, who had led the consumer advocate movement within the New Deal in what must have been a very poignant moment. Perkins had had a very close friendship and perhaps a romance with Rumsey, who died days earlier from complications suffered after a fall from a horse. Now Perkins brought the committee into their home, put a large bottle of scotch on the dining room table, and told them they could not leave until the report was finished. On Christmas Eve, Perkins and Harry Hopkins presented the plan to President Roosevelt. Of course, the bill still had to go through Congress, AKA the usual suspects. Some on the left, such as New York Congressman Vito Marcantonio, thought none of it was progressive enough. Southern Congressman, then all Democratic instead of all Republican, but just as troglodytic as they are today, objected to many things. Uh, farm workers and domestic employees were excluded from Social Security at the beginning, which meant that many African Americans and Hispanic Americans, a disproportionate number of them, would not receive benefits. Aid to families with dependent children was originally paid out at criminally low rates. And of course, the health care provision was scuttled by the AMA. But in the end, the bill passed both houses of Congress by huge margins and became the backbone of the Second New Deal. Within a year, all 48 states were paying unemployment compensation, and nearly 750,000 people were receiving Social Security benefits. I'll leave you with two things, the first of which is about not letting the perfect be the enemy of the good. Most of the criticism of Social Security today tends to focus on the original bill's shortcomings and racial discrimination, but nearly all of these problems and others were remedied over the next 20 years. In 1950, there was a massive cost of living raise of 77% in benefits, along with new provisions that phased in farm and domestic workers at last and the self-employed, inclu including even those useless social reprobates known as writers, uh, where originally about 65% of all jobs were covered, by 1960, 90% of Americans received Social Security. Some continued to object that the whole apparatus remained less than progressive with its pay-as-you-go taxes, but as FDR famously said, 
This way, no damn politician can ever scrap my social security program. Those taxes aren't a matter of economics, they're straight politics. The other important thing I believe the social security tells us is once again, how many different strands of progressive American thought were gathered into real accomplishment by the New Deal. Perkins and Hopkins themselves had a long time real world experience in social work. Poor Edwin Witt, the father of social security was chairman of the economics department at the University of Wisconsin, part of the Wisconsin idea, the great tradition of social and economic philosophy put forward in that state. The term itself, social security, came from Abraham Epstein, an immigrant factory worker who managed to become an economics professor at Pittsburgh. Uh, two Supreme Court justices, Harlan Stone and Louis, Louis Brandeis, quietly consulted with the administration on what sort of bill they thought the court might uphold. I know it sounds strange, but in those days, justices did not spend their spare time scouring the travel sections for empty seats on billionaire fishing trips, but engaged in philosophical debates with other members of government. Uh, we see here in action Brandeis's idea of the states, such as Wisconsin or New York, serving as the laboratories of democracy. As Brandeis liked to say in the 30s, why would anyone go to the USSR when they can go to Denmark, which was his ideal of a social welfare state? As for Frances Perkins, she was not just the only woman in the photograph at the signing of the Social Security Bill on August 14th, 1935. She is also almost the only person not smiling in the picture, something that might seem odd coming as it did at the apex of her life's work. In fact, she had just got word that her husband, Paul, who suffered from schizophrenia, had managed to get away from his nurse and go missing in New York. Immediately after the signing, Perkins would rush back by train to the city where she recovered him later that night. Three months later, their daughter Susanna would have to be hospitalized in Philadelphia, the start of a lifelong struggle with mental illness and more of the terrible burden under which she would persevere in order to ease the inevitable burdens of life that all of us must bear. Thank you. Uh, hello, my name is Douglas Arnold, and I've been writing and teaching about Congress, not Social Security, Congress, for more than a half century. Uh, I've written four books on Congress, and that's what I'm known at in academia. Uh, but I'm here today to try to teach people a little bit about how to think about the politics of Social Security, both past and future past, we want to understand how we got here. Uh, future, we want to know what's Congress going to do about fixing Social Security between now and 2034, uh, when the solvency crisis really hits. Okay, so most of what I talk about today is actually comes from a book that I recently published called Fixing Social Security, The Politics of Reform in a Polarized Age. And I think my publisher requires that I now say it's available as hardcover, ebook, or audiobook, uh, and either will help you sleep. Uh, okay, so with that, with that out of the way, I want to begin to talk just about policymaking in America, or really anywhere, is often the result of a clash between political parties. Every once in a while, in the United States, a single party gets to make policy. Uh, that's what happened with Obamacare. Uh, we had a Democratic White House, a Democratic Senate, and a Democratic House, and they together, with no Republican votes, uh, produced the Affordable Care Act. The Republicans do the same thing in 2017. Donald Trump and a Republican House and a Republican Senate uh, made, made the Tax Act of, uh, of, of 2017. But that's rare in American society. Most policies in America are made by, by, part of, by partisan groups. They really have to be uh, given the way Congress is set up. Um, so ordinarily, the parties come together in conflict, but then they gradually find ways to cooperate and make policy together. 
that's been true for Social Security in the past. It's been, uh, it's really bipartisanship is baked in, into Social Security. Okay. So how do we go about examining this kind of partisan conflict? How do we figure out what the parties really want and what are the parties? One is you can look at their positions. You can ask candidates uh, or often candidates will simply announce when they're uh, running for re-election re or for election uh, what they stand for. Uh, parties produce platforms. We can read their platforms. Or you can look at actions. You can look at what legislators uh, introduce into Congress. Um, uh, we can look at actually the actions of individuals on roll call votes. Uh, we can step back from that and ask where do citizens stand, the mass public, where do citizens stand? And we can ask how Democrats and Republicans differ from each other. And finally, you can step one more step back and ask about donors. Uh, uh, how do Democratic donors and Republican donors differ and how does that affect policymaking? Okay. So to repeat just a couple of things that Kevin said about the history of, uh, of Social Security, the proposal came from, from FDR, okay? It was not a congressional proposal, it was a White House proposal. Um, and some Republicans and some Democrats did their best to block it. They didn't, they didn't want it. Uh, they wanted some aspects of the Social Security bill, but not what we now think of as the retirement policy. Uh, they did their best to block it, and FDR refused to let them have what they wanted if they wouldn't also support what he wanted, which was the retirement plan we now know as Social Security. In the end, when it got to the, uh, to the floor, 95% 95 per, 95 of House Democrats and 98% of Senate Democrats supported it, but so did most Republicans, 84% of House Republicans, 76% of Senate Republicans. So Social Security was established uh, initially by a party, but eventually uh, by, by a bipartisan consensus. That's even more true if you look at how Social Security evolved between 1939 and 1972. Um, Sometimes, in fact, there was really a bidding war uh, between the two parties as to which, uh, 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 how much they were going to increase Social Security benefits. We didn't then have automatic cost of living increases. Uh, and there was almost a bidding war. Uh, and again, if you look at the, the, uh, the history of the expansion of Social Security between 1939 and 1972, you'd have to say it was largely a bipartisan consensus. Okay. That broke down in the 1970s. All of a sudden, there was immense conflict between the parties. And the reason was in 1974, they started automatic cost of living increases. They simply look up what the inflation is for the year and automatically increase everybody, everyone's benefits by that. When they passed it in 74, there was a fair amount of inflation and then quickly inflation took off. And then we had what's called stagflation, which is basically a recession and inflation all at the same time. And Social Security was going broke quickly. It had no trust fund. The, enough money was not coming in to pay benefits. And in 1977, they had the first solvency crisis. And that was solved mostly by raising taxes, but also by cutting benefits too. That was in 1977. It was a bipartisan bill. Uh, but quite frankly, the Democrats got more of what they wanted than, than the Republicans did. In 1983, the solvency crisis returned, uh, uh, again, because of galloping inflation. And now uh, the conflict in Congress and also with the White House with Ronald Reagan was so severe uh, that we, we, uh, we, they set up something called the Greenspan Commission. Now, there's one thing you need to know about the Greenspan Commission. It did put together a solvency plan, but it was mostly a short-term solvency plan. It was a solvency plan for the next decade or so. It didn't really fix Social Security in the long term, but it certainly fixed it for as long as Ronald Reagan was in office and as long as legislators were thinking electorally about, uh, about uh, their survival. But then when the bill got to the House of Representatives, something truly amazing happened. 
House Democrats and House Republicans fix Social Security for the long term. Now, the long term isn't forever, but it is the last time Social Security was fixed. It was 1983 and is projected to be solvent till 2033. And in, in the land of Congress, that's a very long time. Okay, how did they fix it? Uh, the Greenspan Commission had all sorts of short-term fixes, but what came down on the floor of the House was what's now called, or then was called the Battle of the Condiments. Yes, the Battle of the Condiments. Why? Well, Claude Pepper, Democrat from Florida, recommended simply raising taxes enough to fund Social Security for the next 75 years. Uh, he was one of the condiments, Pepper. The other was Jake Pickle, Democrat from Texas, and he recommended raising the retirement age. And when it came down to a floor vote, literally half of the Democrats sided with, uh, uh, with Pickle on raising the retirement age and virtually all the Republicans, and that beat back uh, the idea of major tax increases. So when you look at the 1983 plan as a whole, it was largely a cut the benefit plan by raising taxes and, or by raising the retirement age rather than a raising taxes. Uh, but whatever, it was a bipartisan compromise and it was literally half of the Democrats uh, joining all of the Republicans uh, to raise the retirement age. It fades in over a 40 year period. Okay, since 1983, partisan conflict has worsened. How do we know that since uh, there hasn't been a single vote in Congress on, on, uh, on changing Social Security? Uh, one is you can look at party platforms. Uh, party platforms between 1948 and 1980 were, were almost interchangeable. I could read you a paragraph of one and the other, and you couldn't tell me which was the Democratic platform, which was the Republican. The platforms started to get a little little uh, uh, um, uh, conflictual after that between 84 and 96, but it was still a sort of respectful. Uh, but beginning in about 2000, the party platforms are simply hostile. The Democrats say one thing, the Republicans say the other thing, they don't see anything in common, okay? So you could look at those platforms to see a conflict. You can look at the actual actions. We actually had a budgetary surplus in the overall budget uh, in 1999, and Bill Clinton as president said, well, let's devote that surplus to, quote, saving Social Security. Uh, the Republicans were opposed and it didn't go anywhere. Uh, in 2005, President Bush said, no, let's replace uh, part of Social Security with a privatized plan. Uh, the Democrats were opposed to that, and suddenly the Republicans, who said they were sort of in favor of that, they went they fled for the hills too, because uh, uh, there was just too much opposition to it. And, and so down went privatization in 2005. So that's partisanship and partisan conflict on Capitol Hill. But here's one place we don't see conflict, partisan conflict right now, and that's among citizens, among the mass public. Um, I use in my book a question that's asked every two years, an identical uh, from 1984, about do you think we should spend more on Social Security, less, or about the same amount? Overwhelming majorities of Americans say, oh, we should spend more. Uh, and there's virtually no difference between Democrats and Republicans on that over time. There's virtually no difference by income. There's virtually no difference by age. There's no difference between workers and retirees. People broadly support Social Security in, it, in its current form. If you ask people about remedies. Should we may raise the maximum taxable wage base? Should we uh, raise the retirement age? Should we raise the tax rate itself? Uh, there's no substantial difference between what Democrats and Republicans say about that. So why are Democratic and Republican policymakers so polarized if citizens are not? And that's pretty easy. It's pretty easy for me. Uh, first of all, the Republicans have spent the past 20 years individually taking what's called the Norquest Pledge, uh, named after the uh, the president of the Americans for, uh, actually I forgot, Americans for Tax Reform. Uh, and the Norquest Pledge says, I vow I will never vote to raise taxes. 
Okay, they all do that when they're vulnerable candidates raising money in their first primary. They don't want to stand out, and so they do it. But whatever, you've got a House and a Senate full of legislators who vowed never to raise taxes, which is one of the principal ways to save Social Security. Uh, many Republicans also still talk like they're in favor of privatization. Not that word, it's a dirty word, uh, but they talk about market solutions and, and all. Uh, but the fact is, if you keep putting off Social Security reform, as we have done, uh, it's almost impossible to save Social Security without raising taxes. As Republicans have come to realize that, they really have no place to go right now. Uh, and so they actually haven't introduced a single Republican plan in Congress since 2016. Okay. I'm not at all optimistic that there will be a successful reform plan in the next few years. I wish I could tell you otherwise, but not. Um, I am highly optimistic there will be a successful reform plan around 2033. Uh, why? Well, no legislator and no president will want to face the electorate having allowed Social Security to reach insolvency, which means roughly a 20 or 22% cut in benefits. At that point, legislators will see the light. They will find, uh, okay, I guess we can raise some taxes after all, but there'll also be compromises. Um, I don't see it as a time that lots of benefits will be increased. In fact, some benefits may be pared back, particularly for the wealthy and perhaps a less generous cost of living uh, increase. But there's no doubt in my mind that legislators who are about to face the electorate in 2034 will not want to face the voters having just allowed Social Security to go uh, into insolvency. Uh, so with that, that's the sort of an outline of the politics. I believe I move things on to Nancy, who's going to talk a little about solutions. Doug, thank you very much. And let me say that I'm actually going to present a little bit more of an optimistic view uh, about um, action in the next few years. Um, I'm, my name is Nancy Altman. I uh, have been working on private pensions and social security for nearly half a century. Um, I've worked in the private sector at a law firm. I've worked um, on Capitol Hill in the executive branch. I actually was Alan Greenspan's assistant on the so-called Greenspan Commission. I've um, taught at the Kennedy School of Government and the Harvard Law School. And I joke that late in life, I joined the barricades. I have co-founded an organization, which I'm now the president of, of, which you can tell its view from its name. We, our organization is Social Security Works, and we are working to protect and expand social security. We've had a lot of important history, and let me add a few more details before I get into the future. Um, as um, Kevin mentioned, uh, President Roosevelt signed Social Security into law August 14th, 1935. And in the signing ceremony, he called it a cornerstone in a structure which is being built, but is by no means complete. And as Doug talked about, there were steady expansions every few years, until, uh, including 1972. And after that, the expansions, there were the Yom Kippur War, the OPEC oil embargo, which brought in stagflation, a glitch in the benefit formula, which caused benefits to rise inadvertently. If they hadn't stopped, they would have, they were, um, it looked like they would be, people would receive more in their benefits than they received um, while they were working. So they, but as Doug mentioned, Congress responded with the Social Security Amendments of 1977 and 1983. Every year, the actuary, starting in 1941, every year that um, Social Security has paid benefits, the, actu the trustees of Social Security issue a trustees report, which projects out not 10 or 20 years or 50 years, but three quarters of a century, 75 years. And so back in 1983, the following year, the trustees report showed that Social Security would be an actuarial balance for the full 75 years until about 2057 and beyond. So why, as Doug said, are they projecting shortfalls in the early to mid 2030s? Well, the reason is that what 
was not projected, was not understood, was the income and wealth inequality, which really skyrocketed um, during the 1980s and 1990s. So in the 1990s, projections started to appear that there would be a shortfall. Um, President Clinton reportedly started talking to Speaker Gingrich about legislation to restore Social Security to balance, but uh, the um, scandal with Monica Lewinsky, the impeachment happened, and that halted all talk. A few years later, President Bush, at the beginning of the second year, to his credit, did offer a proposal. Um, but as Doug reported, it was privatization. It was very, very unpopular. It was not even introduced into Congress, even though it was a Republican-controlled Congress. Unfortunately, the wrong lesson from the um, privatization fight was learned by Democrats as well as Republicans. And that was everything we do, don't touch it, it's the third rail, avoid political accountability. So sure enough, President Obama created the Bull Simpson Committee, committee which would have fast-tracked the um, legislation through Congress. It had to, would have had to come up for an up or down vote, that is not what happened ever before in the history of the program, including um, through the Greenspan Commission, would have been fast track, no amendments, but it didn't get the two thirds votes it needed in the commission, in the Bull Simpson committee. So the, the, um, the proposal just died there. But in the last decade, Democrats have returned to President Roosevelt's vision and have been calling for slow and steady expansion. The Democrats now see that expanding Social Security while requiring the wealthiest to pay more is a solution. It's a solution to a, lo a looming retirement increase, income crisis where too many workers accurately fear they will never be able to retire and maintain their standard of living. It's a solution to income and wealth inequality. And as Doug said, and I think this is a really crucial point, the American people are overwhelmingly united. Social security is an extremely heavily polled issue. It's been polling, they've been polling about it since the 1930s. Our organization polls about it, the AARP polls about it, the Her Conservative Heritage Foundation polls about it. Every candidate for office polls, and the polling all comes out the same. The American people do not want to see benefit cut. They think that the benefits are too low. They'd like to see it expanded. They'd like the wealthiest to pay more, but they are willing to pay more themselves if that's what it takes. In that sense, what the Democrats are calling for, which is increase benefits and require the wealthy to pay more, is in, a, in that sense, a bipartisan solution. It's, it's supported by about 80% of the nation. And there are a number of bills have been introduced that do that very thing. The um, Senator Sanders and Warren have introduced a, a bill in the Senate, which increases benefits by about $200 a month, which is, is quite a large increase, has some other targeted increases, does not require anybody under earning under $250,000 to pay an additional penny, does not impose an undue burden on those earning over $250,000, and yet, according to the actuaries, would restore Social Security to actuarial balance for the full 75 years and beyond through the next the end of the century. There's a bill that's been introduced in the House a number of years, and it's about to be reintroduced probably in July um, by then chairman of the Social Security Subcommittee, now Democrats are in the majority of the House, and he's and so he's ranking on the Social Security Subcommittee, John Larson. His bill also expands benefits. He doesn't require anyone over un, earning under $400,000 to pay more, consistent with what President Biden has um, advocated. And he has gotten, if you can believe it, over 200 co-sponsors, all Democratic, in the House. So it's you only need 218 
to pass a bill. And in last Congress, he had 200, and he's on his way there for this new bill that he's about to introduce. Similarly, President Biden has, he hasn't introduced something as president, but as a candidate, he talked about the same thing, expand benefits, don't cut, and um, um, don't require anyone earning under $400,000 to pay more. So there, there have been bills that have been introduced that restore Social Security to balance while making the benefits more adequate. That might surprise you given all the media hyperbole about the crisis and um, it's going bankrupt and all of that. Well, the facts are that Social Security is highly affordable. It's very efficient, less than a penny of every dollar is spent on administration where the 99 cents is returned in benefits. Currently, benefits as a whole account for about 5% of gross domestic product. At the end of the century, that's gonna rise to just 6% of gross domestic product. Now to put that 1% in context, the COVID pandemic in response to that, Congress spent more than 1% of GDP on relief. After 9-11, military spending went up at more than 9, 1%. The, when the baby boomers, which are part of the cause for the, um, the aging of the population is, is causing the shortfall along with the income and wealth inequality. The, when the baby boomers entered kindergarten, um, spending on education was more than 1%, increased by more than 1% of GDP. And those were unplanned surprise events, COVID, 9-11, the baby boomers just showing up. So we've known about the um, baby boomers from the, the actuaries have been following them since they were born um, and everyone knows, and they're still over a decade um, before there is any um, shortfall at all. So whether to expand social security, cut its modest benefits or leave benefits as they are while restoring it to long range balance is a matter of values. Social security is just too important to be changed behind closed doors with a fast track process that avoids political accountability. And the Democrats have said, hey, let's do this out in the open. Here's our plan, what's yours? But as Doug mentioned, the Republicans haven't offered any legislation. And in fact, the 2016 proposal he referred to was one that was introduced by a retiring member in the lame duck um, with no co-sponsors. So Republicans um, still appear to want to avoid political accountability. And, it, and that desire has been really reinforced by the failure for there to be a, a red wave that was predicted in um, 2022. In fact, there's polling out that shows, you know, as leading up to that, a number of senators and congressmen, the speaker, the current speaker, Kevin McCarthy, others, um, Ron Johnson, were all talking about um, wanting to hold the debt limit hostage, thinking they had to, they wanted to sunset Social Security, they wanted um, to make it have to um, um, make it discretionary and so forth. And there's polling that shows the uh, um, American people took notice and did not like that and decided not to vote for those Republicans after all. You see the politics in the State of the Union when President Biden simply pointed out what I just pointed out, that there were Republicans talking about cutting the program, ending the program, and all of them, including Marjorie Taylor Greene, yelled out that he was a liar. So, and I think um, you mentioned the Republican Study Committee. They at least have put their, um, their, uh, their recommendations in a, a budget. But compared to last year, this year it's very cryptic. It takes you about five readings to see what they're saying. It's all talk about bipartisanship because they know that if they do come out with um, what, the, what they say they want, which are cuts, they'll get voted out of office. So the, we're now facing in Congress um, Speaker McCarthy has said he wants a bipartisan commission. Um, and it's clear that if that happens, it'll be another fast track process that will um, 
may end in failure, but certainly will get the Republicans through the next election. So we'll have to see what happens. If the Democrats concede, and they might be forced to, to avoid a government shutdown, then, then I'm with Doug. Nothing is going to happen in the next few years, and we may just keep um, having no action. But if they were to unite around a single proposal, a proposal put forward by the Biden administration is one that the mainstream media could not ignore. They are able to ignore the Larson plan, even though it has 200 co-sponsors. The Sanders and Warren plan is not realistic, but a Biden proposal around which the Senate had hearings, the House Democrats called for hearings, it would be impossible to ignore. Now, it wouldn't become law. The um, Republicans would filibuster it in the Senate. It would not come up for a vote in the Republican-controlled House. But it would then become an election issue, which is exactly what it should be. And as um, Doug pointed out, the Americans are united. The, if, if it became an election issue, every member would, every candidate would have to say where they stand, not just platitudes, we love Social Security, but are you going to vote to expand it? Are you going to vote to cut it? Are you going to vote to make those earning over 400000 pay a penny more? Um, and that, I believe, is the road to progress. If we can get that as an election issue, I actually think we will make progress in the next few years, in the next few Congresses. Republicans, I think, will fall in line. If they go behind closed doors once more, it will fail again, and we will then be uh, having this discussion, um, as Doug says, in 2026, 2028, and so forth, until action is forced. And with that, Teresa, I turn it back to you. Yes, um, and if the panel will come back on um, on view, that would be great. Thank you so much to all three of you. Yeah. Uh, we are now turning to, um, as Nancy left us, the future of Social Security, lessons learned from right now and lessons learned from the past. So I have one question to you, um, Kevin. Yeah. Um, well, I'm thinking about the coalitions that, that can be made for a, a a plan that protects Social Security, expands benefits, and expands revenue. What are the lessons that we learned from the past? And especially, what were the voices of, of capitalists? Um, the insurance industry, you know, um, speak through their representatives, the great industrialists of the time, the, the Ford Motor Company, the burgeoning um, GM, mm -hmm. and the steel interests. And finance, what were the voices of the bankers, you know, in the ears of our lawmaker, lawmakers? And from those voices, what can we project um, to the future or right now in the politics? Uh, yeah, uh, you know, in the 30s, uh, the National, uh, you know, Manufacturing uh, Association of Manufacturers, which was very conservative, which was a big voice for industry, was completely opposed to Social Security. The National Chamber of Commerce was kind of more moderate on the issue and going back and forth because I think they quickly realized how popular it was. Um, mm -hmm. And there was some kind of a lot of right wing feeling where they kind of made out like, well, Roosevelt's going to force you to to have a number and you'll have this number that'll you know follow you everywhere. And isn't this totalitarianism? You know, uh, there are other uh, less conservative voices, but people like Senator Thomas Gore who insisted it was socialism, you know, and he wasn't going to stand for it. So there was a general opposition to it, but things were so kind of, uh, you know, just uh, tenuous in the 30s that uh, big bankers didn't really make a point out of coming out against it. Um, and I think uh, both uh, Doug and, and Nancy made terrific points about how Republicans kind of want to hide this today and you know they both mentioned the party platforms that was very interesting to hear how they had differed over the years um and i, I would point out that in, in 2020 uh the, the republicans did not even issue a party did not even write a party platform it was just kind of whatever the great humongous says that's what we believe in which is a you know complete dereliction of duty but that's that's what we're stuck with now and i i completely agree with Nancy that we should really make social security an issue 
in 2024. And I think everything that they, they both Doug and Nancy pointed to is just how uh, correct Roosevelt's statement uh, was that his pay-as-you-go taxes, they're not as progressive as we'd like, make this a really almost invulnerable program. It's the most loved social program in American history, consistently loved, and it's very hard to simply get rid of, you know, and I, and I love that, They're both referring to Bush in 2005 after running the entire campaign on issues of security, 9-11, uh, all of a sudden, he came out after barely winning the election by one state and came out and said that he now had a mandate to privatize, you know, Social Security. He did not, as we as we quickly saw. Uh, so I think that should tell us something going into the future about where Democrats, where anyone uh, opposed to this neo-fascist um, major party we have now, uh, where we can make a stand. I remember so, 2005. Uh, yeah, um, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, so I, I agree. If I were in Nancy's position or Kevin's position, that I would do everything I could to make this an election issue in 2024. But the problem is, how do you make an election issue for Republicans when, first of all, most Republicans are in pretty safe seats. And Social Security is not about to go insolvent. That's a decade or so away. How do you make it a live issue for those Republicans today? So there's the first problem. And the second problem is starts with an advantage. Social Security is literally the only program in the federal government that cannot be changed by simple reconciliation bills. Reconciliation bills only need 51 votes in the Senate. Every other kind of bill needs 60 votes in the Senate or it can use. So this protects Social Security from Republicans say trying to do it in, but it also means to pass any solvency bill now, you need 60 votes in the Senate. And how do you uh, get roughly 10 Republican senators all excited about Social Security reform now. I know how to do it in 2033. I mean, it's just going to happen. But I think that's the challenge about making an electoral issue today for Republicans uh, um, when they're, they don't face lots of challengers or don't face competitive elections in the House. They do in the Senate, but not very many of them. Well, let me, let me respond. The, actually, in, in a weird way, um, the hardest way to, to uh, make an election, an election issue is if Donald Trump is the Republican nominee for president because he has made it very clear. He keeps saying he understands the politics. He says, I'm not going to cut Social Security. Now, his budgets as president did propose cuts to Social Security, and he's got a long history of calling it a Ponzi scheme and so forth. But any of the others, they've all come out and talked about privatizing Social Security, or I'm going to tell you the truth, we need to cut it back, or we need to raise the retirement age. So it becomes very easy if the Democrats unite around a proposal, very easy for President Biden and, the, and to run ads saying, this is what the Republicans are going to do. This is, and have, you have lots of clips of all of them, like Pence and um, DeSantis, all of them, and he, actually everybody but Trump. Um, saying things that are completely anathema to their own base voters. And then you, go, you get um, dog the uh, candidates and say, do you agree with your presidential um, standard bearer? Are you going to vote with him? And that becomes the issue. But the Democrats have to unite and make that. Um, but I don't, I don't think it's hard to make an election issue given that it's, it's a presidential election year. Um, I have an, another round of questions. So, I, and I think you address this. Um, and I go, I'll go to Doug um, first. Um, is there any downside to Biden um, to do what Nancy has suggested? And I, I agree as well um, to make a plan to to formulate a plan of his, and um, to make that a keystone in his 
um, in his campaign so that Democrats can follow um, and the, maybe the Republicans would have to oppose. Uh, and since you say what Biden might propose would be pop, uh, popular, I don't know why it's not happening, but how can you, what is your speculation on that? Uh, are, are you asking me, Tracy? Yes, yeah, yes. first okay. you, and then so, I, I'm, I was, so Kevin. I, I have to say one of my disappointments back in the uh, uh, last presidential election is five different Democratic candidates had so-called solvency plans. Uh, two of them, Warren and Buttigieg, would solve 100% of the, uh, okay. uh, the solvency problem. I believe uh, Sanders was like 75%, and I forget what Klobuchar was, and Biden was 26%. So mm -hmm. it wasn't much of a solvency plan. Um, and so it seems to me that so, that rather than putting forth a solvency, a long term solvency plan, uh, he's put together uh, or endorsed um, expand the benefits. And uh, and I'm happy to to consider expanding the benefits if you're also increasing solvency. But if you sort of raise the maximum tax of the wage base to enrich to increase benefits, then you can't later do the same thing to uh, uh, to make Social Security solvent. So I think the challenge is uh, to come up with a plan that really advances solvency. And mm -hmm. if there's also money left over, or if you can squeeze out enough money to uh, to in, uh, expand some benefits too. But I quite frankly, uh, as, a, as somebody who cares more about solvency uh, on this than, than any other aspect of Social Security, was disappointed that Biden had the weakest of the five presidential candidates. Of course, he won, uh, but uh, he had actually the weakest solvency plan. Uh, um, Nancy, if I can go to that um, um, point and then, and then to Kevin to reflect on the history. All right. So is your first... Um, uh, priority is solvency? I actually see as important as solvency is it's a means to an end. The goal is to provide basic economic security. And the reason Social Security is so popular is that it, it works. It, it is um, portable from job to job. It's very secure, backed by the full faith and credit of the United States. It's nearly universal. It's one shortcoming is that its benefits are too low. So it strikes me that what we, the, the way the, the policy debate should flow is what level of economic security do we want to assure working families through this collective vehicle? And then how, what is the fairest way to pay for it? And it is true that um, the, the main source of revenue always has been and always will be, and this is Kevin's point about um, President Roosevelt's famous quote, is to, to show people that it's an earned benefit, to have that money deducted directly from the paycheck for the, for the insurance that, that you get. But there is a small amount, this was added in 1983, of Social Security's revenue that's, that's progressive, about 3%. If you raise that just a little bit and brought in other progressive revenue, because even eliminating the cap just makes it proportionate. So there, there's plenty, as I say, it's one, we're talking about 1% of GDP. There's plenty of um, sources of revenue that we could find that we could dedicate to social security and we could still keep it as an earned benefit separated from the general fund. Um, and that's what uh, in some of the Democrats are moving towards, but Doug is right, President Biden is not there yet. It's more progressive Democrats that are there. So we, we'll, we will have to see, and again, it becomes hard because President, uh, former President Trump understands the politics. So he becomes, he's got all his other baggage, but on this one, um, he may be uh, more popular with the Democrat, with the Republican base than um, DeSantis and, and his other um, opponents. I, I think that's very true, uh, Nancy. And I think that's in a way, how good government works. You know, they pull us and we push them when everything's working well. Uh, <laughs> ways we can push them. You know, I, like theoretically, I think a great way to make it solvent would be a, a good immigration plan where we kind of fill in that yes. gap from the baby boomers. That's kind of a non-starter. But 
sadly. But in in lieu of that, I think there are all kinds of things we should be pushing and pointing out. Um, you know, Nancy, as you mentioned, that the um, uh, the media is, uh, you know, pretty, uh, pretty much hyping the whole issue. You know, I, I find the national media in general, even people who think of themselves as liberals, tend to be really kind of economic conservatives. They're almost obsessed with balanced budgets. Uh, they're obsessed with, well, the Social Security will be bankrupt and then we'll get no benefit. You know, um, we have to kind of push them and ways to do it, I think, would be things for instance, pointing out, you know, Teresa, you, you've written about kind of the, the wrong-headed elite, uh, you know, just work longer consensus, which I think is very true. Um, you know, as, as a white collar worker, I intend to keep, you know, working away until the brain gives out. You know, my, my typing fingers are still going pretty well mm -hmm. and I can, you know, turn pages of books. We have to get across uh, how retiring at a decent age is important from the many, many Americans, the majority of Americans doing hard blue collar work, you know, and how, you know, there's a reason why your police and firemen's unions, you know, have benefits like they get to retire at this, you know, at an earlier age, you don't want a 65 year old cop running to your rescue, you know, you don't want a 70 year old fireman going up a ladder and helping you. And we have to realize that that's the same thing for many Americans. So I, I think we should push that. I think we should also push the idea of how delaying retirement is in fact kind of a big, you know, invisible tax on young people. You know, it means that many more uh, job openings they're not going to get that much longer. They're probably going to have to delay getting good jobs and making money in this economy. So, you know, if anything, I would I would love to push the retirement age down, um, you know, and that I think we should be, you know, stressing these sorts of things. Um, I know, and it's it's difficult, you know, the Republicans are so ideological. Now, you, uh, Doug mentioned the Norquist pl pledge after Grover Norquist, the notorious lobbyist who wants to drown government in a bathtub. Uh, I think perhaps we should try to publicize just how no Grover Norquist's ideal state worked in the Northern Marianas, where he and a couple other lobbyists helped fund this um, this horrible, you know, just turn this this uh, territory into kind of a giant sweatshop uh, with all sorts of horrible ramifications. So I think, yeah, we have to just pound and pound and pound on what their supposed great new state with privatized social security or nothing means. And at the same time, talk about actually improving things on social security for most Americans. In, in the last, I can, um, and if minutes, I can, I, I, just then, I didn't want to get the audience. The, I, I just want to get the oh, audience. Oh, God, it's sorry, really good sure. question. Um, and, and maybe look, can I throw them out, and then we'll close by all of us um, responding to this. So, so keep your um, memory brains on. People yeah. have really asked <laughs> what the American people have always said, and every time I go to a um, a panel, they ask us, "Why not just tax all income?" Uh, for Social Security, just raise the cap, you know, on earnings, tax it like we do Medicare. They want to know about that. Um, they want to know if you're talking to first year college students or, you know, people that age, college age, what would be the first, you know, thing you would say to them? How would you introduce this subject? Um, they also want to know um, what a populist Trump might do to the GOP. I mean, he is the voice in the wilderness saying don't, he's not going after Social Security like the other Republicans do. Is that some hope? Will they bring on the other kind of um, other Republicans? And then the last, um, the other thing that um, a um, an audience member asked is, what is the um, impact of an artificial intelligence on either the politics of Social Security or, or people's retirement planning? So that was four things, raise the cap, a populist, Trump, um, having you talk to young people about Social Security, and then if we have time, throw in your um, creative hats about what AI will do to this um, to this debate. So whoever wants to go, this, this will be your last word because we only really have time for. I, I can't I can't resist the populist Trump one, so let me take that one for a second. Uh, 
I don't have a clue where Donald Trump stands on fixing Social Security. Um, it's pretty clear that he does not want and therefore, it does not want the Republicans to be associated with cutting Social Security benefits. But mm -hmm. he's also got a strong history of not wanting to raise taxes. In fact, every time he turns around, the proudest thing, I think, from 2017 was the tax cut. And I think he'd like to do some more tax cuts. So I think back to Nancy's point, in the presidential debates, the most important thing to do first of all, for the primaries and later the general election, is to push and push and push, not about what he doesn't want to happen to Social Security, but what he does want to happen. Uh, how does he propose to, and if that happens time after time of every, every presidential debate, we may find out if the new populist Republican Party uh, actually has different stripes or if it's just a, a, a cheap line. Anybody else? And to, to add to that, um, it, it, to me, it's clearly just a cheap line because he surrounded himself with Mick Mulvaney and other um, people who wanted to privatize Social Security. He proposed cuts in his budget, but his he understands the politics and won't say it. I think the, um, the point about young people, so I, I, I do think it's going to be fascinating to see, maybe a little bit scary for our democracy, what happens um, in the presidential election, and we'll see so it, what happens with Social Security. I think the other questions are great. The um, lifting the so-called cap, that is the mm. um, proposal that every Democrat has, has put forward. It tends to be very popular. Most people, 90, um, um, there are only 6% of wage earners who make over the maximum. 96% make, um, make 94% make under, so that most people don't even know that there is a, a maximum, and when they do, they don't understand it. So it's a it's a political um, winner. But I but that simply makes the the FICA contribution proportionate. Um, so I really think it should go further and and bring in investment income and other um, sorts of things. And I'm see it we're 902 so kevin i don't want to take all the time if you want to jump in but let me actually just close with one point which actually um adds to what what kevin was saying and this is something to talk about with young people too and that is that it's been a mark of progress and civilization to co constrain work and to have more leisure time yes we and this is part of franklin roosevelt's legacy we used to have um child labor, we used to have six hour work weeks, we used to have 12 hour um, work days. Those were, that was again, Francis Perkins with the um, Fair Labor Standards Act and the um, allowing unions to negotiate and so forth. So it's really going against the tide to say we should be having people work longer, we should be increasing the retirement age. We see what's happened in France with the protests um, that were there over Macron seeking to do that. And I think that is also the right policy. It's the point Kevin made about opening doors for younger people so that since we, we don't want age discrimination, we don't want mandatory retirement, um, but we do want to give people an ability to retire. And that I think is Franklin Roosevelt's legacy. And I think the Democrats are right to return to their roots and build on that. It won back for him in four terms. And I think it can win for Joe Biden and the Democrats as well. I, I quite agreed as I think those are great points. Um, I think we should, you know, really the, the whole justification for capitalism is supposedly that it works, right? That our whole wealth keeps increasing. And that you can debate that back and forth, but that's the justification. And a good part of the New Deal was slamming into place the 40 hour work week, which was a huge change. Um, but it's that's where it's stuck, and there's no reason why it should remain there. We need to drive it down more, um, you know. And and you mentioned AI. Uh, I'm I'm actually on strike with the Writers Guild of America now over an AI issue. So this is this is here now. You know, we're we're a curious union. None of us have jobs, but we're on strike. But um, in any case, we are. Uh, you know, AI is an issue. 
And this is going to be an issue coming on. This is how, you know, the machines change our lives. And that can be, should be a good thing. And the whole history of modern capitalism has been the people who own trying to take all the profits from the next technological innovation and um, all the rest of us trying to pull some part of that back for ourselves. So in some ways, this is continuing the struggle, um, but we need they, to do it. In closing, can I ask the lightning round um, to all of you, you know, 15 to 30 seconds. Um, you have an 18 year old in front of you. Um, what do you say about social security? Nancy, you wanna go first, I'll go backwards. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. When you ask 18 year olds about social security, they'll say they don't believe it's gonna be there. But then if you ask the follow-up question, do you want it to be there? Do you, should we cut benefits because it won't be there? No, they mm -hmm. do not want it. They know their parents get it, their grandparents get it. I always make the point that social security is there right now for them. It provides disability insurance. If the, the God forbid they go out and get hit by a truck and they can no longer work, maybe a little bit older, 25, they would get disability benefits. Same thing with survivor benefits if they have young children and they're receiving um, secure guaranteed retirement income. So the seniors are not greedy. They're not fighting for their own benefits. They're fighting for their children's and grandchildren's benefits. And I think that's the right thing to do. Um, Doug. So let me make it 18 to 30 year olds because those are the people I've taught for such a long time. And I've had these chats with them. Uh, sure, they, they spout the line. They don't think it'll be there for them. And so I then ask them, are they saving more for retirement since Social <laughs> Security won't be there? Not a single one has told me that they are. So by their behavior, they're expecting it will be there. Yeah, I, I agree. That kind of affected nihilism is, you know, that's a feature of youth. I mean, but I would I would say to them, uh, it will be there if you fight for it. Uh, believe me, you're going to need it. And the earlier you can get us alter cockers to to get off the scene, to get out of the workplace, <laughs> the better it will be for you. Um, what, what I say it really works is that Social Security is there so your mother doesn't have to move in with you um, <laughs> um, when she's 70. That, that doesn't. <laughs> That's a good um, one. If I could, I, thanks everyone. If I could turn it over to Arlene um, to say um, goodbye to us on behalf of the Living New Deal. Hi, um, so thank you so much. Thank you. Good night, thanks, everyone. Arlene. Thanks everyone. Bye. Good night. Bye. Thanks for watching. Bye.